Yeah, we're ready to get started. Today we're finally in the final moment of the conference, if we have a keynote. We're sort of strapped for time, so I'll be quick. I just want to take a moment to give out a bunch more thank yous before we leave. A one is to all the participants today for having such wonderful papers and panels. Two is to the discussants who gave really extraordinarily excellent responses to all the papers. Thank you, Pats, Kidano, Mike Tomnoy, and William Ryan. Uh, especially thanks to the Therosophy Center for supporting this, to its staff, and to the faculty who have done so much to support us and help us out with this basic data. All this week. Okay. Um, and lastly, I want to thank and introduce Professor Mark Driscoll from the University of North Carolina. We've had the pleasure of having a number of really great speakers for these conferences in the past, including Harry Artunian and King Kawajima. It's my pleasure to add Mark Driscoll to that list, and I think we're all very excited for his talk entitled The Whites of Enemies of Heaven, Race and Decoloniality in Japan, 1835-1885. So without further ado, go ahead. Thanks, Kevin. Great. Um, thanks a lot to the gang of three. Um, oh, wow. First, thanks, of all, thanks a lot to the Gang of Three, Kevin, Ted, and John, for inviting me. It's a real honor to be here. Um, also, the talks today were just uh, really exciting and insightful, and uh, as were the discussants' comments. I just want to know, didn't you all get the memo that that's not supposed to happen in the area of studies? <laughs> so you should be more obedient about that. It's not supposed to be that exciting. Um, the last thing is that I can't speak to a room this big unless two-thirds of you are on Facebook. So if you could accommodate me that way, that'd be great. Um, this is going to be kind of dense, hopefully dense in the sense of Fukai, not in the sense of Baka or stupid. Um, so I'll just jump right in here. Um, in the spring of 1881, the main teacher of Genyosha, that's the group I'll be talking about. It's supposedly a Uyoku K group, but um, that operated from 1880 until 1945. Takabaran left her house in Fukuoka, Kyushu to call on a power, powerful official at his mansion. When this bio-female trans man came up to the huge gate of the mansion, Takaba was hailed by someone inside. Takaba sensei, come on right in. The modernist writer Yume no Kyusaku put, wrote the punchline this way in his 1928 book on Genyosha. If Takaba were an ordinary sam samurai, she would be expected to bow deeply, saying, thank you so much for graciously, graciously inviting this low life into your mansion, or some form of that. Instead, Takaba declined, um, especially because she despised all officials, especially ones with sinfully luxurious residents like the one she was in front of. With a characteristic sense of rebelliousness, Takaba dismissed the filthy rich of who, who by this time had personally come down to the, to the gate, um, saying that your entrance is way too s small for me to enter, sir. My balls are so big I'll get stuck halfway through. This is a picture of Takaba late in life, actually, when she's uh, 60. So you can see the um, used to ride through the streets of Fukuoka on this on this ox here. Born in 1831, Takaba's optician father petitioned the Chikuzen, the Fukuoka daimyo, for samurai status for his son. Osamu and the characters are the same as Ran, just before her 13th birthday. And it was approved. This happened. It wasn't just one time. It happened several times. As an only child, the father brought Ran up as, as a boy um, who inherited uh, the father's business and for 28 years held two professions as an eye doctor and the head of her own school of Sino-Japanese studies in Fukuoka. Just a little bit about Takaba's background. Matriculated to the private Kamei School in 1846, not the prestigious Chikuzen Do Domain Academy. And this is a time of intense ideological and political crisis in Japan, as I don't have to spell that out. As the alternative school in Fukuoka, commoner, merchant, and samurai youth lived and learned together at Kame, so lived together, hung out together. In Kame's pedagogy, de-emphasized the standard recitation model based on the top-down transmission of knowledge from the master sensei to passive students. Kame elicited individual opinions and instituted a debate structure in school. And the Confucianism of Kame's is obviously either Yamazaki or Sodai. It was Sodai school um, Confucianism. And just a little bit about Sodai. I know this is kind of boring, but um, rejected the moralism and quietism of Song Dynasty Neo-Confucianism, especially, especially its main proponent, Yamazaki Ansai. Against this, Sodai construed um, a dynamic metaphysics 
claiming that sociopolitical institutions were made or invented by humans, and alternately, that humans were made by objects, music, poetry, and dance. Sakui, or, or this making, was the, was the focus, of course, of Mariyama Masao's famous reading of Sodai as a modern subject-centered thinker. But I was, I, was, I was trained to hate everything that Mariyama Masao wrote. So my critique of this is that Sodai was really an object-oriented thinker, as much as he was a subject-centered thinker, emphasizing the dynamic ontological force in the 1720s for Qin and Han period prose came up 1,500, 2,000 years, 1,500 years before in Tang poetry as well as Japanese music and dance. This is a picture of Sodai there. Now, Kamei school was shut down by, by Tokugawa authorities in 1800 for heretical teachings, reopened in 1816 and became the matrix of oppositional thought in Fukuoka and sponsor of a secret society. This is um, Kinoto whose creed accord was restore the emperor, fight the whites. That's my translation of, of, of Joey here, which is much more historically correct than expel the barbarian. Takaba started her own private school in 1855, largely borrowing the Kame curriculum and the modus operandi. Everyone lived together and shared everything. But she but added uh, Aizawa Seishisai's 1858, this one it was published officially, New Thesis, which is the canonical text for revolutionary ideo ideologues. And also, at, at her own school, they intense, where all the Genyosha founders studied, um, intensified this emphasis on leveling classroom hierarchies, with sharing of food, duties, and books. Why this intensified communism? Just think about that just for a second. Why this emphasis on communism in, um, in the 1860s, 1870s, beginning in 1858? Guha talks about the elementary aspects of peasant insurgency, identifies negational, inversive procedures, quote, against colonial rule. Now Perry, the, with, with, the, with the U.S. incursion into Japan, humiliated the Tokugawa leaders, opening up Japan to trade with the U.S. in 1854. Now remember, although this is almost never, ever articulated, that white power dynamic was completely top-down, so the exact opposite of the power dynamics in some of the classrooms in Fukuoka. So Perry's demand was sign this treaty, or we, we blow Edo back to the Jomon period, is what he said, and along with its one million residents. So this is a top-down or a vertical power dynamic. It's obvious, or it should be, although it's rarely stated as such. Subsequent Euro-American deportment in the treaty ports was a toxic assemblage of a gold rush-like affect, colonizer extraterritoriality, and white supremacy. That's just the reality in Yokohama, and which started in China, of course. And whiteness here, I was, I was gonna say, and this is how it is for, the, for, for, some of the, for some of the revolutionaries in the 1860s, 1870s. I call this a hyper-object, and I'm following some of this new, new work in environmental philosophy by Timothy Morton and others. This is picture, people know this, hopefully, this is, at the signing ceremony, it's March 30th or March 31st, I forget, 1854, three years before the Dred Scott decision, Perry put on a minstrel show. Of course, the, the Edo authorities, the, the, the shogun had a, um, had a uh, sumo event, and then they had, they, had a, they had kabuki. But the U.S. put on a minstrel show there, and this is a pedagogy into kind of the way the world it was going to be um, for the next, next hundred years at least. Um, now, just quickly about, this Mito, about the Mito school Shinran. Um, was distributed in classical Chinese first in 1825 and then published in Japanese in 1858. By far the most important um, textual presence in what I call the, the river stationary movement, which combines revolutionary with restoration. Now, you're supposed to... <laughs> Japan Studies hasn't treated this text very well, either in Japan or in the US. We're supposed to read it as just a reactionary, kind of defensive, absolutely, um, um, a document that's completely paranoid, really. So, I mean, some of the readings really think that this is just a completely paranoid document. We look at it, this encoded a Taoist and Neo-Confucian meta metaphysics, which located heaven, the earth, humans, and non-human entities on a similar ontological plane. That's kind of the metaphysics of this, at least in my reading. Similar to Japanese nativist metaphysics, which is distributed flat ontology, that almost all things, things that are present, have kamis in them. 
And this is, this is what I'm arguing this homolog homologous with recent um, object-oriented ontology, which is kind of the hippest thing in continental philosophy. Sorry about that. I'm saying that mainly in a good thing, but some way in not a good thing. Now, the other thing about, about Shinran, it was unbelievably modern in its construal of race. What it said about race was, was kind of amazing. But it's, it, it actually was, it was written partly to support the, um, the expulsion edict of 1825, which required coastal domains to fire on Western ships. Like the expulsion edict, new, new thesis featured a surprisingly modern construal of race based on phenotype, which was exactly how the, North, the white North Americans would see race in the 1850s. You can read that. Um, this is, some, this is just some more from, from Shinran. The Western powers all believe in the same religion, wicked Christianity, which they use as a bait to annex every country. Wherever they go, Westerners obliterate native forms of worship, deceive the local people, and if this doesn't work, seize territories by force. They're intent on subjugating the rules of all nations and press gang all the peoples of the world. This is interesting here. When the Western barbarians desire to colonize a country, they invariably employ the same tactics. First, they use trade as a means to obtain knowledge about the country. If underdeveloped and weak, they send troops to invade. If the country is strong, Westerners are just spreading Christianity inside the country to conquer or cover. At least the last thing. Specifically, the English lead us far, far from the way by the seductions of the profit motive and bewitching us with Christianity. So it's this customary samurai. In some sense, this is exactly what you're supposed to say as a samurai in 1825. But the other thing is that this is close to a counter anti-globalization ecological perspective, where there's an emphasis on the local, the ecological devastations wrought by, by global trade and neoliberalism are just hopefully apparent to all of us. But this needs to be posed, I think. Obviously not, Isaiah was not thinking about this, but we need to bring these readings to kind of what's happening here and try to hold off this paranoid nationalistic reading. Of, of, of this, this kind of, of this crucial mito school text. Mere American soldiers and traders opposed to the way of heaven. This is what Aizawa says. The Christian West rides roughshod over local economies, ecologies, and cosmologies, introduces the scourge of possessive individualism. Who in this room wants to argue against that? Marx identifies a cosmologist conflation of Christianity with trade imperialism as a Euro-American imposition of a capitalist social soul onto the whole world. This is exactly what Eisenhower was saying, the different language, actually. Now, the proper East Asian response is ecological, place-based resistance against Euro-American global trade, one. Ideological vigilance against Christianity, two. Three, what I call a stand your ground, this is, this is ironic, imperative, against Euro-American territorial incursions. This adds up to fight the whites. Now, this is a little bit abstract. Um, to go quickly through this, I've, I can talk, well, we won't have time to talk about this, but I've summarized some of the critiques about whiteness from the 1860s around this. And I, did, I identify, and I'm using this, this book by Denise Fedeta de Silva, that's really the most, the most important thing in critical race studies in 30 years, um, called The Global Idea of Race. And using, kind of informed by that, or prodded by that, um, a couple of different thinkers identify kind of white imperialism as to split into two parts. One is the empirical territorial level, which is gunboat imperialism, and two, the transcendental level, where the productive, what Ferreira de Silva calls a productive nomos of international trade and treaty port happens. Abe Masahito, to give you a concrete example of this, said, these people are saying this is universal international law in the 1860s. Where did this come from? They're saying it like they didn't invent it. <laughs> I mean, these people are perpetrating, but, but the sense of this is already abstract and kind of transcendentalized, that it's over any kind of empirical kind of situation was extremely frustrating um, for the shogunate in the, in the late 1850s and 1860s. Now, very quickly, Federer de Silva sees Hegel as the intellectual perpetrator of this restoration of whiteness. Um, after it was put on a, Ferreira de Silva's reading says the Enlightenment science basically um, um, put all humans on the same plane. Um, Kant, Kant's, Kant's problem is basically to try to restore European Christians to a, to a to supreme position. Hegel's really the one who does this. 
who kind of splits whiteness into these two different levels, one transcendental and one territorial. You remember from the phenomenology of spirit, the master-slave kind of dialectic. There's always a battle. There's a race war in Hegel. Almost all Hegel's like this. There's an empirical war where people are duking it out for for, for, for hegemony. But also there's this other thing, there's a transcendental level hap is happening. Ferreira de Silva says only European Christians can do both of those things, can subsume the victories or the losses from the battle on an empirical level and recode those or, or be owners of those at a transcendental level. I'm, I'm seeing that, okay. This is, this is from Takaba Farkanchi from 1860 where I get the title for, for my book here. This is, this is the Chinese uh, for um, the whites are enemies of heaven. Now, to return back to the group Genyosha that I'll, that I'll talk about for the rest of the time here, um, it's, been a, it's been a doxa in Japanese studies that the origins of Japanese imperialism, it's that easy. You don't have to talk about um, centralized capitalism. <laughs> you don't have to talk about um, the history of East Asia. All you need to know is that there was a couple of these renegade right-wing um, groups, and th that was the origin of Japanese imperialism. The only civilian killed at the, in the Tokyo war crimes out of the Class A crime criminals was a Genyosha member, Hido Takoki. He was also the prime minister during the, during the Nanjing massacre, but he was the only civilian killed. It was a Genyosha member. But my reading of Genyosha and some of, the, some of the, what's happening in the 1850s and the 1860s identifies them as one of two of the three most important decolonial groups in East Asia from 1879 to 1911. Here's part of their resume here. Two of the six founding members were fought in the Boshin War of 1868 to 1869, the war for the restoration or revastation. Now, the other thing about, just quickly about this and what I didn't know, I, don't, I wasn't taught this, but white people in Japan were routinely attacked during Boshi. Seven were killed and 28 wounded to such an extent that the British legation secretary, other Europeans said this too, wrote that every European in Japan was threatened or attacked during the war. So the, so, so, so the Boshi War was both a civil war and a decolonial war. It's pretty obvious if you unpack it just a little bit, hopefully. The other thing is all founding members of Genyosha were involved, were in, involved in planning one of the four central samurai uprisings of Fukuoka no Hand of March 1877. So there were four of these. And this was construed at the time through Mencius's condoning of political violence. I call this liberation sinology. Um, now Fukuoka, it's not really known, but was one of two centers of a, what I call autonomy and people's rights movement in Kyushu. Kumamoto was the other one. I don't think they had the mascot yet, but um, now, after undergoing torture in prison for 12 to 18 months, Genyosha members opened up their own private school. I mean, there was all of the, all of the so-called rebel, there was, there was, it was, it was, it was um, stop and frisk. It was preemptive war. People were just swept off the streets in most of the main cities in, in Western Japan. Um, their teacher, Takabaran, became one of, the, one of the lectures at the school, famous school in Fukuoka called Facing the Sun. You can see the characters there lasted for 20 months. It hosted Saturday evening lecture debates, which attracted between 1,500 and 2,000 people. Not that, lots of places like this. Obviously, Kochi had this, Kumamoto had this huge explosion in, um, in this um, popular kind of uh, desire to do politics. Um, Hidano-san definitely knows this. Ueki Imori was one of the two in, in, intellectual leaders of the autonomy and people's rights movement, was the main instructor at, at for Genyosha for four months in 1879. Um, there's a lot more to say about that, but, but, but Facing the Sun started a political wing, a political wing which was, according to, to, according to some historians, and there's a huge debate about this, wrote the very first draft constitution in Japan, was written by the political wing, Genyosha's political wing, called um, um, Chikus, the Fukuoka United Patriotic Front in February 1880. Um, United Patriotic Front, this is incredible. Again, this is supposed to be a fascist, fascist imperialist group. United Patriotic Front had annual elections for leaders, which all males 20, 20 and over were given political franchise. There were no property restrictions at all. Very similar to Kochi and Kumamoto, actually. Um, what's important is they called for economic boycotts of Euro-American products. So they tried to have this Kyushu-wide boycott of Euro-American products. Um, 
from facing the sun to face, facing Asia. Um, facing the sun changes their name to Genyosha. There are the characters there. In, eight, in January 1880, why? There's a debate about this, but because the education mission of Facing the Sun was basically successful. 90% of the Fukuoka public supported their demands, immediate adoption of constitutional government, immediate rejection of the unequal treaties. That was just a basic, those are the basic demands. It weren't just specific to Western Japan, but other places too. Now, there's a, you see there's a turning away from Tokyo towards or the emperor facing the sun towards Asia. Why? Is I want you just to think about us uh, longer if we have more time, but we don't. So I got to give you the answer. The oligarch counter. This is a counterinsurgency against the popular movements. This is generally known, although not expressed um, fervently enough, in my opinion. In fall 18679, the Tokyo oligarchs intensified the crackdown against the autonomy and people's rights movement. Agent provocateurs, undercover police, the uh, false, the planting of evidence, just like what Ramparts did here in LA with, with, um, against black and Latino men. Um, that's what they did. Beginning, now this is because of that, because of the playing of dirty politics by the oligarchs, it was the beginning of the conflation of the oligarchs with white imperialists. This is exactly the same game. Hakoto Rokusuke, who was the, who was the, the main Genyosha thinker actually, said that their actions are more heinous than the whites, that the Japanese oligarchs is obviously an early instance of a Twinkie critique, yellow on the outside, white on the inside. Um, now, the, let me just jump over this. this. This doesn't work, this pun here, but um, to little effect, actually, because the petition movement just es escalated. The petition, the, the, the politics of the, of the autonomy and people rights movement escalated. From 1860, from, eight, from 1879 to April 1880, when petitions to Emperor Meiji via the Privy Council, there's been a traditional way, it had been since, since, eight, since 1869, are completely banned. There were over 100 petitions presented by um, autonomy and people's rights movement from all over Japan, including three from Fukuoka United, pa from the Fukuoka U United Patriotic Front, which, had, which was controlled by Genyosha. Now what happened usually when these things were rejected is that the people would go on lecture tours throughout Japan on this totally, they were, they, they were outlawed. They weren't supposed to disseminate these, and they did anyway. And this was kind of the beginning of the autonomy and people rights tours that went all over the, uh, the country. Now, because of the popularity of these tours, we have something like counterinsurgency 2.00. The oligarchs responded with draconian restrictions on freedom of the press and association beginning in April 1880 banned political meetings completely of more than 10 people in 1880. Teachers couldn't be involved in politics. Students couldn't be involved in politics. The budget for undercover police, which is how they did most of their work, doubled in November 1881. There's all these fiscal layouts for counterinsurgency. Um, now, the money to suppress the, the popular forces created this inflationary spiral. It's like people who, some of the economic history that you could read about this time would have it seem like these kind of, these macroeconomic forces are somehow completely divorced from politics, but the layouts uh, created kind of the inflationary spiral of the late 1870s and early 1880s. Of course, inflation is good for debtors, bad for creditors, right? It's great for the populace, for the, for the autonomy and people's rights movement. It's bad from the perspective of homeland security. Too many people who don't know what to do with money, don't know how to spend money properly, have money. And shit, they're doing politics with this money. Subscription, subscription for the autonomy and people rights lecture series in every large town and city was just an explosion in this. 26 weekly papers by 1881. So there's a huge boom in this. And what better way, so, um, okay. So the last thing on the Genyosha resume, or the next to last thing, is this Osaka incident of November 1885. The Osaka incident of November 1895 was a plan to synchronize uprisings in five different areas of Japan versus what happened, it happened in 1882, 1883, 1884, where there were just individual uprisings in certain places. An alliance with, in, with an invasion in Korea, an alliance with Korean independence activists. But not only that, there was an attempt made to link these uprisings with an anti-Qing revolt in China. So that's one of the lessons that they learned. 
that an uprising is going to get wiped out by these people. We need to have a multi-sided, transnational revolution for anything to change. Um, so, so the Osaka incident was neither a Gilligan's Island-like fiasco designed to invade Korea. These people, this is the origins of Japanese imperialism. All you have to know is these lunatics were trying to invade Korea, according to Jansen. And that line is repeated ad nauseum. Just incredible. Good, my, but so it wasn't that, it, nor was it the most re recent revelation of Hashimoto Toru's love hotel tryst. If you, if you Google Osaka incident, this will come up. So this is the first time he was caught. He was caught, he's the mayor, right wing mayor of, of Osaka, of course. This is the first time he was caught falling asleep in assembly. So they knew something was up. So they did like good investigative journalists, found out why he was sleeping all the time during assembly. <laughs> So now there were 41 people arrested in Osaka and Nagas in Nagasaki. So the, it, but the people apprehended in Osaka and Nagasaki were only those bound for Korea. There were over 100 people arrested together. Everyone else arrested was working for the domestic revolution with a couple of people trying to reroute a group of insurrectionists to Shanghai to start this anti-Qing uprising. Of course, a famous participant in this was Kagayama Hideko was a pioneering Japanese feminist. She was arrested. She was involved in the Osaka incident. She was arrested for armed robbery and trafficking uh, illegal explosives. She said that her goal was to improve women's rights as the oligarchs are doing everything in their power to oppress women. Now, the question is, why the failure? Why did this mass uprising fail? Well, obviously, the first thing is, they didn't have a good mascot, right? <laughs> so they didn't. <laughs> People here in the morning, you'll get that. So why did this fail? And the obvious reason is, I mean, forgetting about the political intricacies in the debates and the factual debates, that stuff happens all the time. But there were larger kind of forces that were intent on wiping these out. And those were, that was fiscal retrenchment, or what's called the Matsukata de Fre, the Matsukata austerity. What happened is finance men or Matsukata Masayoshi convinced the Emperor Meiji that a rapid reduction of the money supply, this is exactly what the Federal Reserve is not doing in the US right now, which is called quantitative easing. This is quantitative contraction. So you suck up money and you raise the value of the money that's left, right? So this is the only way to bring down inflation and the trade deficit. From 1881 to 1884, when the amount of inc incontrovertible paper notes shrunk by 21%, Japan's wholesale prices dropped by the same amount, with that of rice falling by half on the Tokyo Exchange. So all those peasants who had enjoyed their first taste of politics, democratic politics, they're fucked now because the price of their only commodity has been cut in half by the oligarchs. Explicit policy to do this. So what happened in Weimar, Germany, the same thing. You suck up the money, you kill the popular movement, and then Hitler comes in. So, um, so this is Meiji Japan's shock doctrine, the way I look at it. Now Matsukata, he's always read as the great hero who created the Bank of Japan, right? It's a great capitalist hero. He turned Japan into a modern capitalist imperialist country. I'm joking about the last thing. That's not what you're supposed to say. But he turned Japan into a, um, was responsible for dragging Japan from feudal fiscal policies into the modern world. Was he a great hero who created Japanese? Or rather, was he another oligarch terrified of what Etienne Balibar recently calls equilibrity? The historic, now, what I just want to say about this is the narratives of the samurai uprisings from 1874 to 77 with the commoner uprisings that culminated in the Osaka incident usually separate them, but there's so many groups we're doing, we're involved in both of them. There's a lots of overlap here. Um, and this is, well, I'm arguing in the thing, it's similar to, to, to Bill Marotti's reading of Rancière. In some sense, the, the relation the affective relationship to Meiji as an event puts everyone, at least temporarily, on an equal plane. Forget about the people that were saying, the castes are now gone. We only have the emperor restored. Everybody else is the same. That was explicit policy for some people. But the fact of the rupturing event of Meiji also does that at a different ontological level, which is what Alan Badiou would, would argue. So remember, just as I go on here, just a little bit longer, Remember this decolonial double critique. The Tokugawa rulers and then the Tokyo oligarchs are committed to the same rigid social hierarchy that the Euro-American, that the white people are committed to, or the white people open Japan with. That was part of the arsenal, this new racial modern, this new global idea of race. 
1887, Tokyo Street protests, the first mass movement protests in Japan against the unequal treaties. Four Genyosha members were ordered out of Tokyo. That's all thing they could do. What they did was they banned all the intellectuals from the city, right? The Kaichomin had to, everyone had to leave. So at this point, many intellectuals seconded what, what, what Nakai called, a lot of people called, Ansatsushigur assassinationism at this point. They've taken away all other political options. The only one left on the table is to go back or go forward depending on how you read this, obviously this goes back to the shishi, the way some people are looking at it. And people, some people are talking about going forward, that this is going to be a future anarchist politics. Um, now, Genyosha was crucial in this as well. Genyosha's assassination attempts, Kurishima Suneki, there he is right there, uh, was the first suicide bomber in East Asia. I mean, that's a, that's a, a little exaggerated, but blew up um, Foreign Minister Okuma Shigenobu's carriage on October 17, 1889. Um, um, Sugiyama Shigemaru tried to assassinate Ito Hirobumi in September 1886. It's Kurishima. This is a film in 1969 of Kurishima. He almost cut his whole head off after he thought he'd killed uh, Oguma. Now, the thing that I'm doing about this is that I want to try to put together, I've just led this up to this point, and all kinds of things happened again, Yosha, beginning in 1890, and there, most of them aren't good. But for this period of really 15 years, I've identified kind of this, what, I, what I'm calling a decolonial assemblage. What kind of things went into this decolonial sensibility, both against white imperialism and against, um, and against the, the new oligarchic rule, new capitalist centralization um, led by the oligarchs. What we need to look at is affects. The other thing is weather. Obviously, the other, the other, th other thing are texts, not texts, but in the deconstructive sense, is lively ontological objects, right? They're completely separate from authors. They go in, they have this whole other existence after they're, after they're disseminated. The other thing is whiteness is a hyper object. And the other thing is the dead resonated with the living. This is, a, this is easy for us to, 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 to get our heads around as East Asianists. Um, Kind of just to give you a hint on some of the some of the theoretical stuff I'm using here, this is object-oriented ontology, which features a flat ontology, giving agency to objects not usually construed as dynamic. It's close to Latour's actor network theory, but those of us who are doing this don't really like Latour. I'm happy to, um, to, to anyway t tell you about that dirty laundry. But this actually, I put this in before I uh, anyway. I thought this would help you kind of see what's happening because. Actor network theory obviously is trying to decenter humans and to try to put different kind of actants on a certain kind of level to show how they affect, they affect and are affected in, in different um, situations. Now, what I'm arguing is that object-oriented ontology is similar to some neo-Confucianism in granting agency to many different kinds of entities. We don't even have to talk about, in some sense, populist Shinto, different from state Shinto, because that does very similar kind of kind of work. Now, just to go through this pretty quickly, and sorry, this is, I'm realizing this is very rushed. Um, I want to talk about affect first, because that's not often talked about, especially in this period of, 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 of 15 years of this intense kind of a sense of political possibility. Now, affects of rage, enthusiasm, and love were completely salient in these movements, completely salient. Now, these, some of these affects transform, they change from fear of, of Euro-US gunboat imperialism, and they turn to rage against this new kind of racial hierarchy, Fredetta de Silva's global idea of race. Now the other, the other affect that's increased, this classic Aristotelian notion of enthusiasm, there's an incredible enthusiasm for these new political possibilities arising from this precarious kind of conjuncture after the, the, the Meiji break, if you want to think about it as a break. The other thing is this benevolence and love for non-white others. There's a real strong sense of that that's not yet tied to a nation. It's not yet tied to a paternalistic protection of Koreans, etc. It's not yet that. It becomes that later on in the 1890s. 
but it's not yet that. It's not that in the 1870s and the 1880s. And as far as weather, how the hell can weather, why do you want to think, I mean, obviously we're in California, the weather is a really important thing, right? We have drought, affects, us the, affects what we do day to day, how we can think about political futures. Weather was absolutely crucial in the 1880s. The typhoon, typhoon season was unusually harsh in 1881. 1883 and 1888, this from Japan, Japan Weekly Mail, where I got the data on this. Kyushu is where, is, which is where Fukuoka is, is where typhoon, ty, typhoons make land most frequently of the four Japanese islands. Fukuoka's right on the coast. Fukuoka's in what's called the Typhoon Alley. This isn't the Typhoon Alley, but I couldn't find a picture. Typhoon Alley goes this way. That's how it's classically kind of red. But this is, but this is Fukuoka right here. Um, and what happened is that these hyperobjects, these awesome things, kind of, again, the hyperobjects is supposed to, is designed to avoid a subject-centered theory of all this, to look at other kinds of things. That's one of the things I'm, again, it's very easy if it's a time before possessive individualism and capitalist subjectivity. It's very easy to do that. I mean, it's unethical not to do it. <laughs> Because then you would be buying into, just like what Japan studies, Cold War ideology, or a certain kind of celebration of neoliberalism. We don't want to do that. Let's just be, let's just be brute, his, let's just do brute history and talk about the fact that these things are not yet consolidated. So Ganyusha talked about a typhoon temperament. They said, well, let's take this up and see what this can do for our politics. Obviously, it's, a, it's impacting our daily lives all the time. So when, from 1888, internal references to Genyosha's so-called typhoon temperament appear in the archive, forceful, transformative, unpredictable. Um, the other thing that's very important, I don't want to go on too long about this, is the political novel that some people already um, know, know things about. But, just quickly, if you don't know about the Meiji political novels, the, um, the most important one for Genyosha, again, not to think about these things that are authored by specific people, but to think about these things as all also lively ontological things that can impact humans in certain kind of ways. Not, not subject-centered, but these have effects. They're, again, deconstruction does this very well. They take on a life of their own. They become living things, really, after they are published and disseminated. Um, Demons Softly Crying depicts the actions of a group of Russian anarchists from 1878 to 1881, beginning with the assassination of General, uh, I don't even know how to say this. Anyone know how to say this? Anyway, by Sofia Peroskaya, in, conclu in concluding with the execution of Sofia after involvement with the assassination of Tsar Alexander II. That was the, that's the content of these. Surrounding, this, surrounding this na these narrative foci, descriptions of rural poverty, poverty, police oppression, and the routine torture of political dissidents. This is very similar to what's happening in, um, to Genyosha, actually. This is what's happening to the group that, I'm, that, that this book is based on. Um, barely disguised take on Western Japan in the early 1880s, suffering under a surveillance state and the Matsukata shock doctrine. Demons crying softly now inflected politics from the Osaka incident on. The political platform of anarchists was in the novel, was universal franchise, complete freedom of speech and assembly, and workers' ownership of the means of production, with the exception of the last, workers' ownership of the means of production. This perfectly kind of reflects the platform of the APR movement of the early 1880s. But more than just reflection, Miyazaki's text appears just at just the end of the period of armed insurrections and just before the preparation for the Osaka incident. The text object, demon softly crying, and, and inflected other active objects. Now, some of the Genyosha members carried a copy of this around wherever they went. Ten of the people arrested in, uh, in Osaka had, had this on them, had copies, had chapters of, of this on them. The other thing that's important to think about is these, obviously, um, so she said to the militant street performers that were incredibly influential and very popular. Beginning in the late 1870s, a rap-like form of singing and chanting appeared in cities and market towns. This would be this is this is the future of the this is the one of the origin stories of the Jap Japanese popular performance of Enka, but by the 1890s. But in the 70s and 80s, it was an explicitly political art. Even with the oppressive counterinsurgency measures from 1881, these street performers were able to avoid the police by claiming they were just, they, they were just street performers. They weren't, they weren't involved in politics. 
And this is kind of what I think about as the oral kind of matrix for the autonomy and people's rights movement. It'd be interesting to go into some of this, but I don't think we I really have time right now. Um, but rhyming and rhythm made their decolonial message available for a popular Japanese citizenry still burdened by illiteracy. So some of the rhymes are easy to remember. The things were very focused politically. These performers started uh, printing song books in 1884. They were sold by performers on the streets. But the last thing I think, yeah, the last thing I want to I, I want to talk about is this just 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 for the last couple of minutes here is to talk about this talk about race, talk about whiteness as this hyper object hyper object so awesome and overpowering that actors don't really know what to do with not just like regular objects subjects and objects but hyper objects things that are so overwhelmingly awful or powerful that you have to that it it creates an emergency situation to how to how to, how to um, deal with them. Um, again, the overwhelming presence in Japan during this period, treaty ports were playgrounds for white men who enjoyed immunity from, from Japanese law, three or four famous cases of drug dealers just getting off in Yokohama, get, I mean, um, not doing any time. Um, um, there are three or four famous cases of that. Now, what did happen is that there's this new discourse of first of Asian, Asianness followed by yellowness. So there's a some sense reactive relation to this that's not something that comes up. This isn't just this kind of organic racial vernacular. It's something that comes back, comes up as a resistance, or some sense a way to deal with this massive, massiveness of whiteness. And unfortunately, what happens is this discourse of scientific racism, right? Whiteness, yellowness, redness, blackness, etc., becomes incorporated and used in the, auto in the autonomy and um, um, people's rights movement which was enabling, it, it's, it was enabling for some time, in, but obviously very disenabling at another time. But again, to locate kind of the origins of this new language of race, this new racial vernacular, this yellowness, comes from this, this massiveness of whiteness. It really takes 20 years for actors to kind of figure out what's happening in the face of how to deal with this hyper-object of uh, whiteness. I have some more stuff, but I'd rather just shut up and um, um, hear what you all think about this. Um, I'm, I'm, I do have more time, yeah? I, I have what? Why don't I just give it up? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Teachers are students too. Before we go to questions, I wonder if I could ask you to give like a really short summation of hyper objects. Um, you kind of sort of wove it into your presentation, but maybe a slight sort of summary. Yeah. Well. Um, hyper objects are things like um, climate change. Um, hyper objects are um, um, asteroids. Hyper objects are things like that that in some sense kind of show kind of show the patheticness of an anthropocentric epistemology, a human-centered way of looking at the world or approaching anything from here on in. It's a new move in ecological philosophy, not so much ecological politics, but really ecological philosophy to try to show that these things, if you think about, if you think about the uh, pettiness of the human species in the face of all these other things that are going to survive long after the hundred years we have left, or however long you think we're going to be, we're going to be around, right? Probably less here in, in being here in California. So hyperoptic is something that's way beyond the traditional philosophical way of thinking about a subject-object distinction. These things kind of blur that and show how insignificant that is. A subject that is in some sense identifying what's an object, and then at least in Kant, trying to trying to generate new categories to capture, contain, code that object. Hyperobject, hyperobject as a theory is supposed to show how pathetic that is and how useful that is for the 100 or 200 years we have left as a species. All right, so thank you very much. Um, I, I 
、IT ライティオっていう、ディコロナイジング、ディーディングを学ばせる、アニメーション。I just wonder how you might lead、um, the user、uh, relationship to、uh, combinations. Yeah, that, that's a great question. Yeah,、um, the, there's a lot to say about this. As, as you all know, this is a new thing, it's a new subfield in Japan studies, even in East Asian studies. I don't like a lot of it, even though I've learned from some stuff. I don't like it because I think in the, in the, it becomes a rent in the origins of totalitarianism, talks about two different kinds of pan movements. One is a populist movement. One is a, a pan movement that's co opted by the state. It's a state centric discourse. What happens, it perfectly describes what's going on in Japan, in my opinion, because it comes from something that's a pre national or a transnational. Both of those things are happening at the same time in the 1880s to something that's a state centered discourse later on. So that's how I deal with the pan Asianism. Now, the Japanese pan Asianism is obviously as a state. Is a state practice and a state discourse is obviously about, it's a paternalistic, imperialistic discourse about mentoring Korea and China in the ways of to become modern capitalist states. Genyosha and some of the other groups are, they're not capitalist, they're anti capitalist. And so they're doing very, very different kinds of things, and a lot of them are identified. So that's the thing, the pan Asianism that, that sprouts its wings really in the 1890s. Um, is something very different from this thing that, again, national, I mean, nationalism trickles down very unevenly from Meiji, right? I mean, if at all, until the opening of the diet, probably, some people would say. So, whether, and again, it's oftentimes what some of the, so many of the talks today said we need to be careful about assuming that there's something like a Japanese anything. I mean, these are people who are, the Genyosha people, they're imagining their, They're、um, fighters from the, from the Mencius, right? <laughs> That's what they're doing. So, that they're, so their identification is very, um, um, is, 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 is much more interesting, interesting than them. But definitely by 1890s, they're a nationalist group, 1891. Why? Because they get involved with extractive capitalism in Kyushu. There's just too much money to be made in the coal business starting in 1886, and they really get into it big time in 1888. It's awful. They need, they, none of them are working, so they have no other skills basically, and that really、um, gives them money to do the things. And that really changes the way that they look at the world, ecologically, politically, historically. Can people hear me? People are shaking their head.、Huh? Just really quick, just piggybacking up on that, I, I can't help but ask about the,、uh, you blew by it on the, on the slide, but、uh, liberation side now. <laughs> that, was, that was a great line. Well, yeah, I mean, well, I mean, it's also in, this is a project actually, it's, a, it's half of it's on Japan, half of it's on China. So I'm trying to look at If people know,、um, I've been doing for the last five or six years, I've been working in Sichuan,、um, in, which is in Western China, and trying to look at some of the. Actually, I started working in Western China because I followed some Genyosha members there to Sichuan. <laughs> so these two people I followed, I was telling Kevin this last night,、uh, yesterday,、um, I followed some of the people, so called Shinodonin or, or Taidigudonin. There's all kinds of ways to say exactly what these people are, so you don't have to think about what they were doing. Any further, right? So, what they were doing is actually Sichuan was a center for the great game between Russia, England, and France, really. So, so, the, so the mid, there's a big missionary explosion in central China and western China after the, after the,、uh, in the 1858, the Treaty of,、um, of, of Beijing. So, so, so there's, a, there's a battle for this, and some of the local people and some of the secret societies. Uh, rise up against this, and Gu Lao Wei is the,、um, the one that I'm really interested in. And some of these Genyosha people were working with them, working with them in a non paternalistic way, which is also what they're doing in Korea at the beginning. Non paternalistic way, not saying this is how we did it as great Japanese who, who've managed to become modern revolutionaries or modern capitalist subjects. And there are versions of both of those stories, not in a paternalistic pedagogy, but saying, how can we help? 
how can we help? We have this money. Can we can you use the money? Stuff like that. People, the Japanese learned Chinese, and some of them actually went native. Some of the Ganyosha people went native. So what happens in China actually is, is incredibly similar. Now, as you all know, we're supposed to think about these things in completely different analytic spheres, right? What's happening in China from what's happening in Japan. Another bad relic of the Cold War. Another bad relic. So the, the intellectual challenge I gave myself when I kind of followed these, some of these Shinaroni to Western China, all the way to Western China, was to think, well, my God, some of this, the political agon, the antagonisms are very similar. The tensions around kind of centralized capitalism are very similar. This kind of emergent racial vernacular is similar in the face of, again, this monstrous kind of object that no one knows. They know they have to do something with. This thing called whiteness, but they don't really know what it is yet. Um, also, looking back to a certain kind of uh, indigenous tradition of this, because there's no, there's no Rousseau, there's none of that yet. That comes in, whatever, very quickly, 1879, 18, 1878, 1879, 1880. But before that, there's just indigenous kind of intellectual traditions. So the things that are taken up in China and that are still viable in the 1880s in Japan, if you look at the Osaka incident, people, some of the ringleaders, what they're saying about it, they're basing their actions on Mencius, what I call liberation sinology, on, on all kinds of things, indigenous to an East Asian intellectual tradition. I know that's dangerous to talk about that, but that's just a, an historical fact. That's how people articulate their, their politics. A trans, which looks to my eyes to a very modern, transnational, anti-globalization politics, or counter-globalization politics, to be cognizing that, epistemologizing that, in terms of classical Chinese texts, not all, but some, I think is a really interesting phenomenon. It's not one that is going to help us look at contemporary China now, because this is the Chinese state is trying to do the exact opposite. Make sure that people are reading the right, not liberation psychological texts, but what would the opposite be? Bill. Reactive, I don't know. Not liberation, but, but. Yeah, something like that. So, so that's where the liberation sinology. It's obviously I'm playing on that, but I wanted to expose the fact that now, Hirano's written on Uwe. There's a lot of interesting things that happened really in 1879, 1880, where people are there's a transcoded process. So some people are reading Mencius together with and the Chinese classics, together with European, new European stuff that's coming in. So it's it's but. I don't know if you agree with this, but Itakawa people, people, people are too quick to say that this is, that Rousseau is the intellectual dynamic for this, that, or the other kind of uprising. I mean, people had read, memorized these other texts, right? These are, these also were, in some sense, for them, not very living things, even though the, the things are coming from 2,000 years ago. So very lively, affective things, presences in their lives. And the Russo stuff, and Uweki, the smart people like Uweki, they're very smart to make these transcodes, to show that Rousseau's really close to this, that, or the other liberation psychological thing. Okay, here in the back. Yeah. Thank you for a wonderful presentation. Uh, I apologize in advance, this is kind of a narrow question about Japan, and the presentation is very expansive, but uh, the question has in regards to how you sort of situate the Japanese oligarchy within this, because in a certain respect, they represent um, an attempt to maintain like a white sort of style hierarchy, right? It represents sort of whiteness from a certain perspective. Um, and in a different level, they're also kind of behind the scenes guys, like right, manipulating currency and sort of you know pumping up the secret police. Totally true, they're all like vassals, we know that. Mm -hmm. But um, I'm also thinking about some of the other work, like Carol Gluck's book, that's sort of complicated how the oligarchy works in oligarchy works in terms of Beijing ideology, right? Yeah. It's sort of interactive and complex, there's a lot of things going on between what she would say is like intellectual groups and the oligarchy and a lot of back and forth. Yeah. So I'm wondering, in your situation, you seem to talk about the oligarchy, oligarchy in a really kind of solid, um, working together kind of way. And is there room for a complicated look to it? Or I guess we're just sort of asking how it works in that situation. Kevin, there is. There definitely is, yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's a complete monolith. That's how it was lived politically. Okay. That's how it was lived, especially by all the Genyosha people The found from 1881 to, to 1893 had personal cops bodyguarding them, on them all the time. So they lived 
kind of the oligarchy. Their political lives are determined by the oligarchy as this absolutely kind of seamless force. Of course, it was. there's all kinds of tensions, like Gramsci would say, right? The state is just an effect of these contradictory interests that are always battling for hegemony. That's what, that's the reality of it. But that's, it's fine to analyze that, but that's not how it was lived on the ground for the, in the, in the popular movements. People thought that there's an absolutely monolithic, awful, hideous force, as bad as Americans who came in and said, sign this paper, we're gonna blow Edo away and a million people are gonna be killed. So that's how it was lived politically, yeah. I mean, what we can do, I mean, we're, we're on our way to a free dinner, right? Yeah. So you're taking us away from time from a free dinner right now. So am I. <laughs> so we could shut the both of us up, because that would be a very practical response to that. <laughs> um, the political, the epistemological response is that the, the epi it's, a, it's an epistemological move. Let's, let's, try to, let's try to position humans in a different kind of relation to these other kinds of things, not think as Enlightenment science does, that humans that humans can control all these kind of things. These subjects, these European white subjects, have the power to do whatever they want to these other kind of objects. That's crazy. But that's the that's the way that some of us still think of us ourselves as subjectivities, or the machinery of subjectivities positions ourselves in that way vis-a-vis -vis objects. Capitalism does this. Capitalism is the main culprit in this. But so if we reframe that only in refraining that relationship, that fundamental relationship between human-centered consumers and everything else, is there, a ch is there hope? So the epistemological kind of shift is the only hope for any, any human survival on the planet. So would say, that's what I would say. So I don't agree with what Walker says. I don't like that. I think that that's not really right. I think that humans have changed a lot. I think there's a lot of critique of capitalism. What, two years ago, the Pew Research poll said that it was, I think it was 18 to 29-year-olds in the U.S., more 18 to 29-year-olds had a better impression of socialism than capitalism. That's something to work with. That's something to work with. So, so there's a lot of, but again, we need to think about, we need to think about our own practices. We need to think about, we need to think about this awful machinery of subjectivity. That has to be rethought. Can it be? It has before. It definitely has before. <coughs> yeah. Okay. Um, uh, we're getting very low on time. Uh, I'm so sorry. I think we're going to have to uh, call it there. Um, but please come and ask questions. And we'll be around for a few minutes. So please come and have to talk. I want to thank again uh, Crystal for Excellent talk, and uh, thanks for all our presenters today. Thanks for the questions, yeah. Thanks for the questions.